Hey, Senda. Hey, Phil. I come across with a wide sweep of my battle axe as you uh, duck underneath it, um, just in time for you to pull your rapier and uh, thrust in my direction, which I clumsily move out of the way as you clip my shoulder uh, and rip my t-shirt through the shoulder by my neck. Are we going to kiss or are we talking about narrative combat? Uh, <laughs> we better talk about narrative combat. Uh, cue music. <laughs> And welcome to another fine episode of Pandas Talking Games. I am your host, Phil. And I am your other host, Senda, who didn't have to come up with a thing, but thought she was going to for a second there. You just, you don't know which way it's going to go. I don't know which way it's going to go. I'll be you honest, almost went there. I'll be honest, I don't even know until we actually do it. <laughs> until like, it's you not, open your mouth. I don't, I don't, I yeah. don't script that part. Like, I just make it up on the fly. I know. Anyway, welcome. I'm to ep- really aware of that. <laughs> welcome to episode 241 um, with our uh, very racy opening. Um, Oops. We don't script that either, just to We be don't clear. script any of this, right? Like, we, sh- <laughs> we we have some notes for the next part of this. Um, but actually, our, uh, our opening uh, ties into um, our question for the evening, as it often does. Um, tell us about um, who... Has our has a question? Where did it come from, and what is that question? Oh, so many things to remember. So this question is from Joe Perlata on the Slack, uh, the Slack room. One of our Patreon uh, backers. Thank you so much, Joe. Um, and Joe asked, um, or specifically said on the Slack, I think I need an episode of MMP or Pandas to teach me how to make narrative combat a la Dungeon World function. I have tried so many times, and it always feels bad. Yeah. So Aww. yeah. So we never want. I mean, <laughs> we never want anyone to feel bad um, doing something in a game. Uh, so we'll, we're going to share some insights on narrative combat. Now, I'll tell you, narrative combat doesn't have the easiest of definitions. So we are going to start with a couple definitions and kind of build up some vocabulary for this. We'll talk about some advantages. We'll share some tips that we have. In terms of uh, making some, you know, making good narrative combat. And we'll also talk about some pitfalls at the end because um, I don't want to give the appearance that, um, you know, oh, this, you know, narrative, sub- what often sometimes thought of as indie kind of combat thing is, you know, superior to all other forms of play. It is not. It is just a form of play. It has some advantages. It has some disadvantages. We're going to cover a little bit of e- a little bit of that as well as share some tips, because really, uh, we want Joe, and by way of Joe, uh, the rest of you, to get the most out of your narrative combat. Yeah. Makes sense. And, yeah, and honestly, you know, as usual, decide if it's the kind of thing that you like and want to have in your game or not. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I I, I mean, I guess for full disclosure, uh, it is actually my favorite form of combat. It is mine, too. I, I feel like we have to be straight up with that. Like, because of the style of game that I tend to play most frequently, yep. it is the style of combat that I most frequently engage with. But I don't want people to despair because um, years ago when I was playing Iron Heroes and Savage Worlds and 3-5 and all of that, um, I very much played um, full tactical combat with battle mats and minis and I still have a drawer full of minis that are specifically my characters. Yeah. So you've so you've right? you've exp- you've done it as well. So <laughs> yes. I, I want people I don't want people to be like, well, Phil and Send to just play indie games, so they just, you know, they're gonna gush all over narrative combat. Not true. We are gonna talk about narrative combat because that's what Joe's asking for. But but know that we have both played both styles. I will say that right now, where I am in my gaming, just like I said a few minutes ago, right now, narrative combat is my jam. Yeah. Yep. I would I would agree that that is for me as well. Okay. For the moment. Cool. Yeah. Anyway, but so hit us with some definitions so we can actually have this conversation. Yeah. All right. So let's. There's kind of a lot of pieces yep. here. Let's start with the opposite of narrative combat. Let's start with tactical combat. 
right? Sure. So first of all, we got to just be clear, right? When we're talking about combat, we're talking about when a game drops into um, combat or in some games, conflict, whatever. Um, this is not like your uh, like minute to minute narration. This is um, when we're in a combat scene, right? Yes. All right. So when we start talking about six seconds. Yeah. And... Well, perfect. Right. So tactical combat. Right. Tactical. Tactical mm-hmm. combat is um, a case where um, when you're running combat, you have um, various table aids, right? Like a like battle mats with five foot squares, and you have minis, and you might have some additional like um, props, like you might have. Um, fireball templates or you know those kinds of things and the idea is that um as you are playing combat um movement like positioning and movement is is incredibly important where you are on the tactical grid um and i think you might remember this from your days of playing pathfinder and D and stuff things uh, like things yeah. like calculating like where to put the fireball so that the radius so of the much. fireball doesn't hit your party, but to- yes. gets as many of the bad guys as possible, right? Like, mm-hmm. you know, or am I close enough to reach that person so I can do healing on them, be- you know, like before they die? Well, as a rogue player, it was always about, and this isn't how it works anymore, right? Flanking. But for me, it was all about the flanking and I am like the queen of the flanking. <laughs> yes. Um, and how and how do you calculate if you are flanking a creature that takes up more than one square? Oh, I remember. I these, still remember. I these remember rules. these rules, right? <laughs> Got to be able to draw a line between. Got to be able to draw a line yep. to the center of the creature. Yep. Right. So in in tactical <laughs> combat, each turn, right? We we make we move on the grid. Um, what we can and can't hit is determined by its very like its precise positioning on the like on the battle mat okay that is tactical combat a a totally valid way to run combats like i said i have run so many of them in my time so many okay yes narrative combat is the opposite of that it is having a combat where we don't have any table aids and that the combat is taking place in the shared narrative space of our discussion of the game Right? Yes. Um, this is sometimes known as the theater of the mind, right? right. Sometimes the people will refer to this. I think old. I think us old timers will call. Yeah, this I think th- it is a little bit of an old timer. Yeah. Way to theater to, of the mind. Yeah. Um, for me, actually, it is the way I actually came up in D anD. I I didn't actually start with minis. I actually started theater of the mind. Then by third edition, went to maps and minis, and then went back to theater of the mind again. Um, but in theater of the mind, our space is just the shared narrative space. That is, I say, if I was the GM, I would say like what the room looks like and approximately where everyone is. And maybe I would use something like a um, quick, dirty drawing to kind of show you like just to, like a, like, a sketch, a yeah. sketch, anything just so to help. you have an idea of the, the shape of the room and the major features, right. It, right? Just to yeah. set the, um, just to set the what it looks like. And then everybody would take their turns and just describe what they're doing. And we would just continue to play in that shared narrative space um, without any props. Okay. That's probably... So I, I did some Googling on this right before the show. And so when I Googled narrative combat in, in the D&D world, that's all it's talking about, right? Is whether you're playing... Uh, in your shared narrative space, or you have stuff at the table. Right. But indie but. players have like a little <laughs> bit more yeah. of a definition about uh, narrative combat because it, it takes into account another term, which we need to define, which is called fictional positioning. Mm-hmm. Um, and fictional positioning is when something that you narrate has um, that something you narrate affects the mechanics of the yes. of of the game, right? So that um, a good example of this would be like fictional positioning. Like, let's say I'm going to do a non-combat one, but I, I think this will make the point. I am locked in a room, and um, I want to punch my way through the door. Okay, mm-hmm. now if the door is made of like flimsy wood, sure. 
I like then I could make my rolls do damage to the door, eventually break down the door, right? Depending on the yeah. game system, right? Maybe my 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 punches do one d four damage, and like you know the door absorbs two points of damage, but can only take seven eight points of damage before it collapses. Whatever, a little bit of a little bit of time and rolling, I, I break through the door. You can get through it. Yeah. If the door is made of steel, mm-hmm. right? It doesn't matter whether I can do one d four damage with a punch. I I literally can't punch through this door yeah not with your fists there's there's no i mean we're not playing a supers game correct now now (laughs) in a in a in a very mechanical game the door would be represented by having like some armor absorption like some like some sort of absorption like armor absorption that's like 10 so that there's no way my 1d4s could could punch through it and infinitely i could punch the door um and never get anywhere but in narrative combat with fictional and using fictional positioning with fictional positioning, I literally can't hurt the door, right? Like I just, I don't have the fictional positioning to do it. Now, if in the room there is a blowtorch. Sure. Right. Yeah. And now I want to use the blowtorch to cut through the door. Um, I now have the fictional positioning, right? By getting the blowtorch, I now have something that is capable of doing damage to the door, and therefore I can engage the mechanics for damaging the door. Yeah. Is that good? Does that make sense? I think so. I think it pretty much does. Okay. I mean, I think a lot of times in combat, and correct me if I'm wrong, because I know I get a little bit mushy about these terms. I just do the things. Sure, and sure. And like, there's a certain amount of this that becomes instinctual, and then you don't think about as you're playing it, separating these out. So I know that I'm sometimes in that place and haven't necessarily thought about them in a really mechanical way. Um, but this is where we get into stuff like, if I'm attacking you... And I'm like, aha, this brazier full of hot clo- hot coals. Bra- wait. <laughs> brazier full of hot coals? Wait. What's I the gotta, name of the... I, it's a metal brazier thing. Brazier is the word you're looking you. for. Brazier. <laughs> you know, Damn I've got to be honest with you. <laughs> Knowing who you are for a moment, I just let it go. Because I was like, I don't know, what weird, like, what weird setting is she about to make up? But when you stumbled, I was like, oh no. I was like, wait. The wrong word. I'm flattered that you thought I was going to a real place with that. Oh, I honestly, I legitimately thought you were going with a place with that. Like, I was like, I was like, hmm, is it a, is it a steampunk setting? Is it like some sort of like, is it some sort of musketeer thing? Like, I've completely forgotten what my example was, but it involved setting things on fire. So, oh, I can help you. Let's yeah. say. Let's just set this place on fire because I always feel like that's a really strong fictional position well, is to be like, I set it on fire. Well, here, let's do it in combat. Let's say that um, let's say that you have a brazier. Yes, thank you. <laughs> full of flaming coals. <laughs> and you strike somebody who's just wearing cloth armor. <laughs> fictional positioning would demand that that person possibly catch fire. Right. Maybe there's a percent chance. Maybe they just do whatever. Maybe they do. Depends on how you're playing. Exactly. Versus like I'm putting coals on you. Good. They take fire damage, which would be a very mechanical. Sure. Tactical way to deal with it. This damage is X amount of damage and it is fiery damage from your because it's just so hot in here with your brazier. (laughs) So I think the takeaway (laughs) To move us in getting ready to move us into the next section. Oh my God. The takeaway from this is that one narrative combat exists in their shared narrative space of us telling the story. Fictional positioning is a case where what you describe in the fiction gets translated into something that happens mechanically um, in the game. Okay. Yes. Now, Good. those two are not necessarily joined together. You can just do narrative combat in your shared narrative space using your very tactical game like Dungeons and & Dragons, and you're perfectly fine. And it mm-hmm. works perfectly fine. Mm-hmm. Or you could be, in, in the case of Joe's um, question, talking about Dungeon World, where yes. Dungeon World has a very simple move for doing damage, which is the hack and slash move. And it's pretty, like when you read the text of hack and slash, it is very dry. 
mm-hmm. what makes hack and what makes combat in Dungeon World exciting is that, like all PBTA games, you have to lead with the fiction and end yes. on the fiction. So, I don't just say in Dungeon World, I'm going to hack and slash this this goblin. Mm. Nope, I need to never. say what I'm doing. Like, I'm taking my axe and in like a downward stroke. I'm going to just, I'm attempting to cleave this goblin. I'm going to make two goblins out of one, right? Right. And then I roll hack and slash. And then I get my result. And then we translate what that means to the game. Mm -hmm. Um, And and this is important in Dungeon World because on a 10 plus, it's not very interesting, right? I just hit the goblin. I make two goblins out of one, right? No big deal. On a seven to nine... I'm going to I'm going to do damage and take damage. So I clip the goblin. I do not turn him into two goblins. Maybe I do, but he also in turn the goblin stabs me in the leg or something. Mm-hmm. Where that fictional positioning and that that narrative positioning, where that like that um, positioning really comes into play is when I miss and I roll yes. that six minus. Yes. What happens to me has a lot to do, like when, as a GM, when I'm going to take my move against you, has a lot to do with what you were doing Yes. in response to it. So, Because if you had your giant axe and you were doing a big, huge, all your strength downward swing to make the one goblin into two goblins, and the goblin just sidesteps, then you have all this forward momentum and you might just stagger forward and step off the edge of the cliff and be dangling by your hand, Correct. right? But if you were trying to stab the goblin gracefully with your rapier and just run him through, then like the the thing that might go wrong when you miss is very different. Like maybe the rapier hits the like disc of precious metal that is right on his chest and like swoops off to the side and, you know, puts you off balance. Right. Like those are two very different, very different, completely based on how you set up that attack to begin with. (laughs) Exactly. Positioning. Now that is in comparison, that does not happen in Dungeons and Dragons by the rules. Like, yes. not saying how people play Dungeons and Dragons. I'm right. saying, yeah, I'm we, playing, we have to we have to talk about like what the book actually says. Right. If I miss, if, if I miss with my axe swing in D and I miss. Right. You missed it. I missed, and that's fine. And we move on to the next person's turn. When mm-hmm. you get a six minus in Dungeon World on the hack and slash move, the GM's move plays off of what you described. So just yes. saying I hack and slash is not enough. Now, it doesn't it doesn't help the GM at all? <laughs> it doesn't help the GM at all. And also the thing that um most PBTA games will tell you is that you have to actually trigger the move by saying something. Yes. Right. And right. and the reason you have to do that is for just all the reasons we explained. Okay. Mm-hmm. So that's narrative combat. Now, what's cool about narrative combat, right? Like, you know, why why do people even like it? Um so let let's first talk about um the fact that um it's cheaper. Yeah, you don't have to have all the stuff. There's no, you don't have to have, you know, the battle maps and the minis and 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 like in, or or tokens to, you know, however you represented your monsters. For me, there were always a lot of monsters who were shaped like dice because that's what I had available. Oh, but sometimes I, my I had monsters, the actual monsters. My monsters were forever dice. Like yeah. <laughs> or I had um, in the um, early two thousands, I had a CD of um, all these. Um, token images oh, and yeah, i would print, print them, out, them on cardstock and cut them yeah, out yeah. yeah yeah so you gotta have all of those you have to have then to do the combat if you do it tactically you have to have whatever bits you require to make you have fun doing right. that um narrative combat doesn't require any of the bits now again because i you know and we're never speaking down if part mm. of your love of D is buying yeah. minis and setting up like cool like, dungeon like on your table Rock yeah. on narrative combat's Do not it. the thing it's not the thing not the really- thing to worry about here. Yeah. And 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 to be honest, like the reason I still have all my minis of all of my characters is it was a mini for a specific character oh, who was specifically mine. picked out and, oh, yeah. and then I specifically painted to look like that character. Yep. Like, you I, know. 
I mean that, and that was that. I I really had fun doing them. I'm, I'm never getting rid of them. I have a few <laughs> of those. I suck at painting. I had friends paint them for me, but um, I have Aww. a few characters like that. That yes, same thing. Um, right, keep forever. Yeah. Keepsakes. All right. So anyway, so good. one, you don't have to buy. You don't have to buy or have that stuff. Um, two, I will say, in conjunction with that, for conventions and things like that. You travel pretty light with narrative combat. Yeah. Like I have a pretty small GM kit that, mm-hmm. you know, because the games I play have narrative combat, um, at most I need like a little bit of something to draw, you know, the room on to set the set the stage. But after that, it's no problem. So one, my pack is lighter. Yes. And two, I can squeeze into small places at cons. Yep. Like small tables and things like that and yeah, have no problem playing. Yeah. Whereas like your Savage Worlds guys are like, you know, trying to chain a couple tables together and like building sets and <laughs> with lighting and smoke machines. And don't get don't get me wrong. I love you, it's Savages. It's pretty incredible. But I love you, yeah, Savages. But, but it is, definitely, there is like a suitcase with wheels on it that usually travels if you're going to accomplish yeah, that exactly. sort of thing, um, which I just don't. Yeah, I'm like, we, we, we have a history of finding a tiny table somewhere in the lobby with enough chairs around it. And, you know, it's just enough space to like roll some dice, yeah, basically. And just rock on. Yeah. Yeah. So it is an advantage. Another, yeah. another advantage. Um, and this one's tough because um, this will depend on players. Um, yes. Immersion is sometimes better when you do it with narrative combat because when you do narrative combat um you just stay in that kind of space where you're visualizing what the battlefield looks like what your character is doing etc when you have when you're doing tactical combat and everything's on the table um as much as you are in your character you also then have to like count squares Mm-hmm. Right. If you're the wizard, you're you're not even just counting like you're not even just counting your you movement. You're so like you know many squares. Right. You're counting like. out your you know radii and all of that stuff, and that is actually <laughs> pulling you into um, a different level of the game. That's pulling you into kind of the game level, which is like the parts about the rules, the game, and things like that. And so, if immersion, if deep immersion is your thing, and there are people out there who love deep immersion, um, then you know. That that's where like you can disrupt it by yeah. What we what we can combat. say is you will spend less time at the game level, although still probably some time because most um, many systems still have some sort of randomizer and combat that you have to engage with at the game level, right? Oh yeah. So it, it's it's not a question of if you will engage the game level, but it is a question of how long you will spend there, or how right? much jumping how much, back and forth you got to do. Yeah, how much forth. flippy back and forth, right? Yep. Um, so that's a thing. And and that ties hand in hand with, um, and it depends on, again, like what is the joy that you take from, from yep. games? Um, for me, I have a lot of, um, I really take pleasure in visual storytelling um, and the kind of imagery that we can get at the table. And combat is one of those times when you can get a lot of that imagery because it tends to be very dramatic when you think about like really high drama scenes from a lot of the things that we tend to take inspiration from. Like if you think about, you know, Luke Skywalker um, clinging to the bottom of uh, the, the cloud city, right? Like, that's the kind of stuff that could happen in combat narratively and that I might be describing. And it just sends a little version of joy up my spine to be able to have those moments in deep description. Um, yeah, so I, w- I, w- I would challenge you to say that um, it would be tough to, I think, be as excited about um, the battle, the fencing duel between Inigo Montoya and, <laughs> um, and Wesley as a tactical uh, combat yeah. with a battle mat where you're just like, okay, I'm going to move um, I'm, 15 I'm, feet back. Right. right? And I'm then gonna, I'm going to use Tybalt because that cancels out Capifera. Right. Okay. <laughs> as opposed to, as opposed to the narrative version of that. Um, because again, we many of us are accustomed to seeing it on film, but it actually was a narrative because it was yes. a book. Yes. Um, well, it was narrative in, and, Film translates narrative for us visually. Exactly. So the cues yep. that we get from films and that sort of media that we can consume um, translate really nicely to narrative, right? Exactly. So, that's a um, so yeah. I, so again, I, I, that's another advantage is that like if you love 
a bit more description, a bit more visualization to your cinematic. Exactly. A cinematic. You see, I was I was trying to avoid the word cinematic only okay. because cinematic sometimes is like over the top, and that's going to depend on your game system. <laughs> it does depend on your game system. It also depends on who you play with. If you're playing with me, it's going to be cinematic. <laughs> Correct. And I always lean towards that as well, but that's a personal preference. It is a personal um, preference. It's a personal preference, true. and I also play games that support that. Um, mm-hmm. But if you like, if you like combat scenes, if you like the description, the feel of them, narrative combat has just more narration. Yeah. Like that's it right there. It has more narration. And then once you plug in your styles. Yes. Right. Then you can get into like, then you can really get into like, if I want to do like when I do action movie world, when I run that yes. game, like there's lots of explosions, oh, I, you know, like, I, I mean, I ham it up. My, like my narrative it's combat so is like really hammed up because that's the genre that's the setting like we get like really into like you know talking about cars rolling over and explosions yeah, yeah <laughs> exactly and that's and and again it's that, it, that, like that's not going to quite come across the same in tactical combat as it will in narrative okay yes so what? cool yeah, Are I you should good? say, yeah, well, I'm going to say one more thing. As we discuss these, for the sake of clarity, we are kind of talking about them both in their purest forms, and I think many people blend them. So, like, Thank don't you. be don't be like, I play tactical combat, but I still describe this stuff. Okay, we're, we're not really talking about that. We are talking about the purest forms of these two things. I think many people sit somewhere on this spectrum, right? Fantastic. Let me tell yeah. you that before where i was just totally not with you with the flaming Braz- like the flaming coals in the brazier <laughs> i actually was thinking and i was like i was gonna hold off saying anything about it sure but because you said it you are 100 percent correct i have played plenty of savage worlds games where after something cool happens we all stop and narrate it and yes. then we go back to pushing minis around on the table Absolutely right and i have played 100% a ton sure. of savage worlds in narrative like true narrative combat also right like that absolutely happens too anyway so i had to just say that because i feel like there are you know hundreds yeah, you, of twitter accounts screaming out um 100 good job <laughs> okay um cool so carrying it on so so the next part of this is um joe's actual question which is how do you make narrative combat actually function Right. So what are the things that we actually do to make it work, as Tim Gunn would say? Make it work. Make it work. Make it work. Um, so we came up with a couple tips, just a handful um, of tips. So I thought we just thought we'd share some of them. Um, do, would you like to start? Sure. Um, cool. So uh, a couple things just that are actually pretty related. There's one main one for me with sort of two subcategories that relate to it, I think. Um, and I it's the, the main one is you have to work at it to keep it from getting repetitive meaning that if you are in a situation where you really are just like attacking a horde of 50 goblins with a sword right there is a point where describing every slash of your sword there are only so many ways that you can describe that before it gets kind of old right so the first thing is to keep it from getting repetitive if you can and then the other two things about that um are specific you know things that relate to if it gets repetitive. And the first one is um, keeping combat to the right length, which means as long as it needs to be to accomplish the narrative purpose that you're accomplishing by having combat, but not any longer than that, right? So narrative combat does not work well, especially with a lot of descriptive, you know, work involved. It's not very successful if you are in a situation where like, um, you know, you just came across a horde of, of 50 goblins and you're going to talk through the murder of each of these goblins individually <laughs> over the next three to four hours, right? Like that is where it won't necessarily be successful for you because it will be start to become a struggle. It'll get old and it'll get dry, right? Um, And then the other part of this is in order to keep yourself from repeating the same thing over and over again, um, you can actually practice descriptions. And you can do that both by like actually practicing words and saying things. And it is a skill that you will get better at because it is, um, you know, partially at least an improv skill. So I get to now um, tout, you know, Karen 12's book again, Improv for Gamers. 
great resource. Helps you just get the juices flowing. Highly recommend, right? Um, but what you're really doing is being able to describe things um, in really interesting, interactive ways on the fly. And that just means having your brain up and moving in that way that improv makes it move. And that's a skill that you can practice. Um, But it also means that you can consume media that works for the genre that you're running so that you have images in your head to help you describe things, right? Because if something happens, you can sit down and you can be like, oh, it's like that scene because that was so cool. So, you know, when our two characters meet at the top of the cliffs and draw their rapier, then we can be like, oh, we're going to banter, right? Like, it's going to be great. <laughs> um, we're going to have this fight like, you know, who are you? Who are you? I'm looking for the six fingered man. Cool. Um, and we're going to actually have that like that, that kind of scene. We can describe that. We can pull on that um, sort of shared understanding of tropes to help describe and keep things moving forward. Um, so yeah, media is inspiration and practice. Um, I think are two parts to go with that. But I think a lot of I think a lot of narrative um, combat sometimes falls down in terms of being successful because of the repetition. And then that is, you know, directly ties into the length of combat. So if you expect combat to be two to three hours long, like it would be for tactical combat, you're probably not going to be successful being super narrative for that entire time. Uh, Yeah, I have some I have some advice that will tack off of that. Yes. Are are you you good? Okay. Yes, that was all of me. <laughs> all right, so I'm going to um so the first one I'm going to say is that when you so narrative combat's a decision you make during the game, it is not one um so it's not a one and done thing. Like yeah. you can totally have tactical combat sometimes and narrative combat sometimes whatever. So obviously you're going to want to just kind of hash that out with your players and get a feel for like get everybody at the table get a feel for like how much narrative combat are you going to have in your game? Like maybe most of your game is narrative combat, but occasionally you throw together a big tactical one for like a big fight scene, a end boss kind of thing, whatever. Um, along with that, right. So along with setting some expectations about that, um, I would also have the discussion about the role of fictional positioning um, within the game that you're going to run right now. Maybe the rules of your game have some rules about fictional positioning, Maybe they do, maybe they don't. But what I mean by that is when you are doing narrative combat, are you going to give any kind of mechanical bonuses for narrative positioning? Now, if your game just does that, then it does. And don't worry about having a discussion about this. But for instance, if I'm playing D&D and I'm playing narrative style, maybe I tell the players like, listen, on occasion, if your narration's really good, you might get advantage. Yeah. Right. In fact, actually, I think advantage uh, that is one of the ways you get advantage is narrative positioning, I think, is um, I was thinking I was thinking more of a. So let me just back up and explain this. When I was coming Mm -hmm. up with this example on the fly, I was thinking like 3.0 where I would have been like you could get a plus two. Plus two. Yeah. Right. But I quickly jumped to 5e, which is like you would get advantage. Right. So I can do that. Right. I can say, like, look, if your narration's really good, you can get advantage on an attack roll or whatever. Or, um here's a Benny. Yeah, maybe, right. Depending on your game, like whatever yeah. it is, um, might give you, you know, whatever. Um, in Fate, I might lower your difficulty, right? Sure. Um, that kind of thing. So it could be optional. It could be necessary. So if you're playing like something like Dungeon World, like I absolutely, you absolutely have to do um, like fictional positioning right i absolutely yeah. need you to do that it uh, in order otherwise. to make the game go <laughs> yeah. um or i might just not want to do any of that like the game i'm like the game i'm running i'm just like i'm not really engaging in any of that we're just not playing with a battle mat right that's yep. an that, that's a gauge right you can turn that up yeah. and down um i personally like it when it's optional um like if the game doesn't demand it then i like it when it's optional like i will like sometimes say like look if you really describe it or really come up with something like I'm going to help that out in the game. Like, yeah, like, I'm going to reward you. Yeah. I'm going to reward you player for feeding me cool stuff to feed back to you. Yeah. You know, if you're just being super creative about how to like, how to do a thing or accomplish a thing, then yeah, I'm going to like, I'm going to kick in some mechanics to help that happen. Mm-hmm. Um, that's worth setting some expectations for your player so that they also know. Um, Cause it helps them. Like if they know that, um, narrative positioning could lead to bonuses, then when shit gets critical, they'll do it. They'll get descriptive. 
right? Yes. Because they're going to want that advantage. Which is um, also when you want them to get descriptive because it's yeah. also when things get intense and cool. Which is good because that means they'll lean into the descriptions. Yeah. All right. The next one. Um, so one of the things that's like kind of really fluid when you play narrative style is um, distance and positions. Yes. Um, <laughs> I don't. And I don't kill myself on these, right? So I have a personal rule, and I'm just going to share this rule. Um, my rule of distances is roughly like this. It'll depend a little bit on the game system you're playing, but it goes kind of like this. If it's close enough and you're like, can I move to engage that person? If I think you're relatively close enough, the answer is yes, right? We don't take out any rulers. We don't measure it. Just yes, you're close enough. So if there's 15 combatants in the room and you just killed your your recent combatant and you're like i'm going to engage another combatant i'm like no problem you engage another combatant right yep yes just simply yes hand wave it if it's so far away that um it's impossible to reach in the course of one turn then i will simply say something like um no you can't get there this turn but you could get there by next turn if you use this turn to move yeah Right. So basically, I impose X number of turns to get to a place in combat. And combat's usually, it's never more than one turn, yeah. um, unless the place you're playing in is really big. Huge. Right. Um, the, la- the middle of that is that if I think it's fairly close, but um, it's not easily reachable then I might ask the player to engage like some sort of movement check or something like in fate. It might be like, I want to get to this location. Can I get there? And I'd be like, "Mm, it's a little bit out of your range, but with a, you know, difficulty to athletics check, you could reach it this turn. Right. So it's either, it's either, yes, you can reach it. Yes. You could reach it based on some check. Or, yes, you can reach it in X number of turns. Yes. That's my whole movement system when I play. <laughs> and regardless of the game, bands. I have an, adap- I have an yeah. adaptation of that for every game. Um, and I just make rulings around that. Um, and basically, it goes like this. Like, if the players have something kind of cool lined up, um, I don't, like, when I'm playing in nar- narrative style, five. there's no five feet short, right? If I'm playing yeah. tactical and a player is five feet short of the target. They're five They're feet five short feet of the short. target. That's it. Yeah. But if we're playing narrative, then I'm just like, no, nah, it's cool. Get them. Yeah. Like it doesn't matter. Yeah. And you have to be willing to do that as a GM, right? Like yeah. you have to just give it to them because you're not calculating that out. So, you know, not, we've talked about this before. The vision in everyone's head is only as good as we can make the vision in everyone's head. And it's all a little bit different. So, you know, all of that flexes by a five foot square or more, right? So, you know, their understanding of where they are is probably that they can hit that thing if they're asking you. And so, you know, if you're like, yes, you're close enough to hit it, you wouldn't be like, you're five feet away. I'm sorry. (laughs) Right? Correct. (laughs) Correct. Okay. Um, My last piece of advice then um, is, and this kind of ties into what you were saying, is like, there are times when you need to push on the players and yourself to do good narration. And then there's times when you can just relax. So like, for instance, at the start of combat, I like to start off with some really good narration, right? I want to get, like, I want to get tone. I want to get feel, right? If the combat starts to go long, then I will, like, if the players keep narrating hard, no problem. I'll stay with them. But like you said, with the repetition and things like that, if it starts to slow down a little, I'm not as much of a stickler, right, for a little while. But if somebody gets off, like, a really sick critical, then I'll quick pause, rewind, and, like, play that piece out with more narration. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like all of a sudden somebody's like, oh, I'm going to roll to hit the guy and like rolls like a critical. It's like, whoa, back up. How were you attacking him before you like before you leveled this critical? Right. And then go through that narration, then keep going. And of course, if the big bad's going to like if the big bad's on his way down, um, you know, to being defeated, then I'm going to pick up the narration again. Um, But the idea is like, don't burn out on it. Like. 
there are no absolutes to this, like to any of this advice, right? There's yeah. so like there's so much like on Twitter of people just being like, you must, you must. like, no, yeah. you don't. No, you don't. You, no. Even if you're Figure playing full narrative, for you. like, even if you're playing full narrative combat, sometimes it's okay to say I just hit him. And you know yeah, what? I'm gonna I, bla- I, I'm gonna just I say some blasph- I'm just gonna blasphemy right now, right? Sometimes what? it's okay in dungeon world to just say I'm gonna take a hack and slash move. <laughs> uh, rend I, your garment. No, tear I'm gonna up rend my books. garment right now. But what I'm gonna say is because I I don't usually just say I'm gonna hack and slash. I just say I stab I'm him. gonna stab him. Right? Yeah, that's <laughs> like, fine. <laughs> right, and, and if that's all you say to me, I'm like, whatever, make your hack and slash roll, you know what you're doing. Right, yeah. But I'm just saying, like, I don't, like, not every time do you have to be like, with a glint in my eye, I'm going to thrust forward by taking a step with my left leg and thrust this dagger into this goblin's face. Sometimes you just stab the goblin in the face. It's okay. Yeah, sometimes it's okay. you just stab him. And again, the thing with the rewind button and stuff like that. If all of a sudden you get a really sick hit or a really like or you terrible you know a yeah. terrible outcome, Back then up, rewind, collect yep. some narration, move forward. Mm-hmm. Like it's fine. Like, it is. For it's God, fine. For God's sakes, people. Like it's don't fine. be repetitive. It's, fine. <laughs> it's okay. I can only su- describe my my sword singing through the air with the 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 you know the wind whistling against it so many times and in so many ways. I'll tell you a really quick story before we kick into some of the disadvantages. Okay, it's got to be quick though, because no, we no, said we fine. were going to be fast. I know, tonight. no, we're, I know, we're running tight. We're we're okay. <laughs> we're not. Not all is lost. Um, on the thing about being repetitive, Bob used to have this really bad habit in Fory that when a creature became bloodied, that it would like, uh, you would like drop to the ground, cough up some blood, right, and then it was like bloody. <laughs> <laughs> so you just always knew if the it became like a little shtick in the game <laughs> like you know we'd we'd hit something and we'd be like did it cough up any blood <laughs> right like waiting for the bloody marker hit, hit so that, it, hit it again hit it again yeah. did it cough up <laughs> yeah did it cough up any blood because that's important right like <laughs> some of our powers are going to go off in a second <laughs> but only when it coughs yeah yeah okay so anyway and again, it's tough. Sometimes it's not it, like sometimes, especially in a longer combat, being repetitive is hard. So do yep. what you can. Yeah. Back off the detail sometime. Turn it up when yep. you need it. Turn it up. All right. Turn let's talk up, about let's, let's talk about pitfalls. Like this sure. isn't all just roses. Like, yes, you can play at a small <laughs> table and yes, you don't have to buy 100 minis and save yourself money. But the whole thing isn't it isn't just sunshine here. Um, here's some of the pitfalls that you get into. Um, first of all. Narrative combat requires a shared narrative space. And um, that means like you got to do a good job setting up that shared narrative space. If you don't uh, and somebody is off by description, by who's in the room, whatever, combat's going to get weird. It does. (laughs) (laughs) Right? Like if people didn't realize there was a pit in the middle of the room. Yes. Right. And you just weird like weird things like, happen. Yeah. Weird things happen. So they're like, I'm just going to run across the room. And you're like, what about you're just going to uh, well, run? Well, fine. Make like, a check right to jump the over pit? the pit. Like, like what yeah. pit? What pit? Yeah. Right. It, right. So it requires a shared narrative space that um, requires work. So um, it is going to require extra cognitive loads, require a little extra work on your part as a GM and your players' parts as well, because they are also going to have to keep in mind the room with the pit in the middle. Yes. Okay. Um, do you want me just to go through these or do you want to just jump in on, on do you want to just color each sure. one of these or do you well, want to yeah, switch back? Uh, no, I was going to say I can jump in on this one because this is kind of what go my ahead. tip was, but it's also sort of the thing, right? Narrative exhaustion when combat goes long. Yeah. Right. Because eventually you hit that repetition point or you can't come up with more new ways to say it or it's just a long combat. And the thing about narration, as much as I like it, it extends the time in combat because you are making each player's turn take longer because they're describing more stuff um so it is a thing if you if you run long combats already um adding in a bunch of narrative description is going to make them longer it just does it just is yeah uh, the next one is narrative positioning can can increase latency in combat right mm-hmm. like it like if people are describing a whole bunch of stuff every time that their you know turn comes up um and you're describing stuff and they're describing stuff right like that takes longer than i rolled a hit yes 
And it's, it's more colorful. <laughs> it's more colorful. It's really, it, hopefully it's interesting and fun to listen to, right? Um, and there's also a line here where if you are working with fictional positioning, then that description is actually potentially useful as well, yes. right? But if you're not, then this is a lot of color that can be interesting to listen to, but is not actually driving the game necessarily. Yeah. And, and honestly, if it if it is having a mechanical impact, that may actually even increase latency if the GM has to kind of figure out yeah. like how that how goes, to, right? How to deal with that. Yeah. So it's mm-hmm. not the fastest. It, it, it's not necessarily the fastest of combats, which is why... No. The like really heavy narrative combat systems pair well with shorter combat mechanics. Like yes, dungeon world combat mechanics are relative. Like like hit points are relatively small in dungeon world. Yes, um, for this purpose, right? Because combats tend to be faster, a bit brutish, um, mm-hmm. but um, you can pack a lot of narrative into it without getting narratively exhausted or without bumping out that that latency yes yep um the next one i'll say is like look narrative combat is dependent on everybody's energy levels right we talked about that shared narrative space if people are wiped out if people are tired if people have been drinking um Hmm. if uh you've had like a rough day at work holding the shared narrative space is hard and sometimes just having a thing on the table is an easier option yeah. Um, and the last thing that we'll say about it is that it can intimidate people who are new to it, right? Yeah. In the same way that, you know, improv games or games where you have more shared narrative control generally mm-hmm. can intimidate people, um, you know, as, as they first approach it. Um, and the key to this one is that this is a learnable skill, right? Yep. Absolutely. Um, and it, it's learnable both as a GM and as players, um, but it can require some practice. First time you do it, it might not be great, and that's fine. Do it again. Yeah, I mean, I, <laughs> I sometimes, going. like, sometimes I will, um, with newer players, like if I'm playing something that's um, PBTA, um, I will ask them if I can embellish their description a little. Mm-hmm. Right? Just like, like, just to, like, show by way of example. Right? Right. So they might be like, yeah, yeah, I'm going to... Um, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, run I'm up gonna and stab him. <laughs> yeah, I'll be like, cool. Like, like, is like, what, like, what does your stab look like? Like, is it a, is it a short thrust? Is it like a full body extension? Like, what, it, you know, like, just even asking like a little bit of those questions again, it's gonna bump out your latency a little, but kind of it in those teachable moments of play. Yes. Right. Then players are like, oh no, my like my guy's like really controlled, so like all of his moves are like you know like like quick little circles. You yeah. know, like circle back kind right. of thing. So it's actually really like a little slash. Yeah. Yeah. And then it's like, oh, cool. Okay. Now I understand what like your, you know, what your moves look like. Yeah. So Show it is learnable. <laughs> cool. Um, I, I think that's a nice like a little overview on narrative combat. Joe or anyone else, if you have further questions about narrative combat, we will happily um, just make more episodes. Yeah. We'll <laughs> yeah, just we're... make more. It's fine. <laughs> yeah, we're very we'll happy to just add some more episodes onto this yep, um, and totally expand good. upon it. <laughs> but for now, um, we've kind of reached the anointed three quarters of an hour. Mm-hmm. So I need you to tell me about another show on the Mr. and Mark Network so we can jump to the closing. Yes. Um, well, tonight I'm going to tell you about the Gnome Cast, on which several gnomes from Gnome Stew get together to talk about gaming topics and themselves in an effort to entertain you and avoid being thrown in the stew. I'm going to say I was on or am coming. I don't know if I was on a recent episode or am I coming on an upcoming episode. I. It's very difficult for me to track these things. I'm pretty sure because it was me and Jared that were getting all tossed in the stew again because, boy, it was about being off topic. And we were off topic. <laughs> We were demonstrating at the table. It was good. Anyway, uh, yeah, that's our show. Say, Senda, how do people find us on the internet? Well, you can find us on Twitter at Pandas Talk Games. You can find us in the Misdirected Mark forums, which is forums.misdirectedmark.com. Or you can drop us an email, panda at misdirectedmark.com. Or if you're very brave, you can find us on the Tiki Talkies. Um, our, our, <laughs> our handles are the same as our individual Twitter accounts. Yes. And Phil, once they find us one of those places or manage to write that information down, what can they do with it? Hey, just like Joe did tonight, uh, ask us a question about something in gaming right ask us a question pick a topic um 
you know, ask for our thoughts on something, whatever it is. Um, we, it's what we love to do the best. Um, to be honest, we talk a lot. <laughs> so <laughs> we already know what we're going to say to each other. Really yeah. where our excitement for doing the show comes from is helping you all to have better games, right? More fun, more better, um, more better, more fun games. Um, and, and really the way we do that is by finding things that you have questions about, because really if one of you has a question, probably more than one of you has a question about it. Yes. Um, yeah. So like we want, like we want Joe to have a good time doing narrative combat. And we hope that some of this advice and some of our thoughts on it will help um, Joe have m- like more better fun narrative combat. Yeah. TM more better fun, yeah, more better, more fun. <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> so anyway, uh, do that, do that because that is, um, that is the thing we love. And if you do like what we're doing here, um, on Pandas Talking Games or elsewhere on the Misdirected Mark Network, please consider supporting our Patreon campaign. Go to patreon.com slash MMP. Uh, patrons get access to the Slack Room for Life. That's where Joe actually asked uh, their question right yeah. in our RPG room. Right in our um, RPG talk room. A smart place yeah. to ask a question. Good Look place to ask an RPG <laughs> question. Um, and it was the kind of thing where I just saw it because I have Slack open when I'm working. I saw it and I was like, yeah, we'll do that topic. Um, and that's how this topic became a thing. Anyway, you get access to Slack Room for Life. You're going to get the bonus outtakes from, um, you're going to get the after show from Mr. Director Mark, the Bamboo Lounge from this show. Um, you can join our Friday luncheons um, that we do on Zoom for as long as the rest of us who are still working from home can work from home. Mm-hmm. I don't know what's going to happen if I have to go back to the office. I may still do them from my office and just be like, <laughs> and just be like, I'm up. online with my friends. Screw it's all lunch. of you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Y'all couldn't see, but he was definitely, you know, throwing a couple of birds at the camera there. So I don't know. But anyway, <laughs> all of those things look as as uh, as life returns to whatever the next normal is going to be. Um, we'll be doing other stuff with our Slack community. Um, you guys have been fantastic. We've been hunkered down, um, kind of conserving emotional energy. But we're getting to a place in the next couple of months where that energy may be more abundant. Hopefully. Um, and if it is, then um, we're going to shower some more affection on our patrons because we love them. Yeah, actually, um, there's a thing that um, dropped last Thursday um, from one of the gents at Mastering Dungeons, um, Teos. He has a fantastic thing about um, cooperative campaign building that actually just dropped to our patrons this last week. Yeah. So you should go check that out if you're a patron and you missed it. <laughs> yeah, you should. And other stuff, will we will have other stuff in the future, I promise. All right. Um, there is one more thing you can do. It supports our, if you listen to us, you will love us campaign from, uh, 2019. Um, that just holds true. That's a, that's a perennial at this point. If you listen to us, you will love us. Um, it's a thing that you can do besides telling your friends, please tell your friends, uh, post a thing on Twitter. When somebody asks like, what's your favorite, um, it doesn't even have to be your favorite. What's a good podcast post. You know, if you throw our name up, that's fantastic. We love it. There's just one more thing you could do. Hmm. It requires a little more work. But if you could do it, it would be great. What's that thing? You could leave us a rating or review on Apple Podcasts or the podcatcher of your choice. Every new review we get really does actually help new people find the show and makes us feel warm and tumbly like pandas. Not warm like sticking coals in your brassiere. That would be uncomfortably warm. Um... Yes, so thank you so very much to everyone who has already left a review. We really, really, really appreciate them. They make us really happy. Um, and like, let us know if you leave one and we don't respond to it because uh, we can't check everywhere, but I super love seeing them. Awesome. Say, Senda, show me how you're going to describe that awesome acrobatic sneak attack that your rogue loves to do. Yes, well... <laughs> This show is a joint production of She's a Super Geek and Misdirected Mark Productions, the media arm of Encoded Designs. Click, click. Hey, hey, we're going to do this show so fast tonight. It's not even funny. I don't know if we're doing it so fast. We're doing it. So fast. We're going to do it. We're going to do it in a timely manner. Cool. Okay. 
We we don't even have to mess around with this early part because we'll just hit the bamboo no. lounge at the end. Yes. Okay, you ready? I am ready. Bloop. I have too much thirsty sword, everyone. Yeah, you did that. I was waiting for you to start. 